Hello Rebrand Gang, in this video we're going to be taking one of the options of the Toshiba logo and turning it into a full brand identity style guide. Let's go! In part 3 of this series I presented 5 logo and brand board options and had a poll that we could vote on. And I'm now looking at that and the votes are in. And so we had 140 total responses. So thank you everyone who voted. And there is a clear winner here, which is option five with 60% of the votes. And that is 85 of you voted for option five. So a landslide victory. So for anyone who needs a little recap, option five looks like this. And this is what we're gonna be working with today. And we're basically gonna build this up into a full brand identity guideline document. So if you've been following along with these videos, you'll probably have noticed that there's been a bit of a gap since I uploaded the last video. Um, and in a way that's kind of bad because it's like bad upload schedule, but I've just been super busy, so I haven't got round to it. But then the one good thing that came out of that is when I reopened the files to kind of work on this, I kind of had fresh eyes on the project. So I could see a few little refinements that I wanted to make on the logo before I started developing it up into a full brand guide. And I think this is pretty much what would happen in the real world as well, because once you've got that logo, maybe you want to do a few final adjustments to it before kind of concreting it in because obviously if you distribute all the logo assets to everyone around the world all the marketing people anyone who's going to need the logo um, and then you update it after that it's going to be very hard to kind of undo everyone you've sent it to and encourage them to use the latest version so to save put in like a middle ground version that you don't want to use forever into the system it's better to just kind of get it absolutely finalized go back to it look at it with fresh eyes and then kind of just release that one final logo with no mistakes obviously so with that in mind my first thoughts on this project were have a look at the logo refine any little spacing issues and make some small changes just to get it perfected so working on it, I noticed a little bit of letter spacing that I wanted to fiddle around with and just get looking absolutely perfect. And as well as that, I also amended the size of the gaps within the infinity loop. Um, I tried a few different kind of gaps between that, like the, the bit where it looks like it's going behind the bar that's coming in front of it. And I thought that a gap that was around 50% of the size of the letter spacing looked good and also wasn't so thin that it was gonna disappear when the logo was scaled down to small sizes. As I was doing this, I annotated the designs, um, not only for you guys watching, but also I just find that the process of typing out what I'm actually doing helps me justify my actions and also slows down my thought process. So instead of just manically clicking around the screen, making hundreds of changes, I'm kind of rationalizing them as I go. And that just kind of helps me give it, keep everything in order rather than having loads of versions just scattered all over the screen. So one of the important parts of this process that I wanted to highlight was the use of the logo at a small size. As most people view websites on mobiles these days, it's important that the logo works nicely at small sizes. Like in the old days, this would be called like the business card test, which basically means making sure that the logo can be read and understood and is still legible when it's shrunk down tiny on a business card or a small advert. So I tried this logo down at about 40 millimeters and I thought that as a minimum size is reasonable. So I did exactly that. I scaled it down to about 40 millimeters wide and then checked the font size to make sure that was still gonna be legible and not like three point or something like that. The font size was around seven, but the font was Nexa light at this point. So I decided to change this to a bolder cut of the font. I think I ended up using Nexa heavy in the end. And just making it that little bit thicker makes it easier to read like on digital and makes it easier to print and then obviously easier to read in print as well. So now that I had a logo that I was happy with, I cleaned up the paths by using the Shape Builder tool and the Pathfinder palette, just so that each individual element had one vector path that made it up rather than just using all overlapping shapes that can be a bit of a mess. And then I saved myself a final logo file and on artboard one was the blue and orange version of the logo. And then I make another artboard with a reversed version. So just in this case, I just changed the blue for white. Um, and it's good to have that all in one illustrator file because then when we're in InDesign later, creating the brand guidelines, if I wanna switch the logos, I can just update the link and choose page two. And it's all just contained in one illustrator file rather than having multiple like separate files. So once this was all saved out, I also saved a version with no strap line as well in case I need that in the future. And at this point, it was time to start building the brand guidelines. So the whole idea of this document is that it shows a few rules and guidelines and basically how to use every aspect of the brand so that I can send this off to anyone in the world, any designer in the world, and they'll be able to look at this, read for it, and then create an on-brand advert or landing page or anything else that they need to create for Toshiba. 
Now one of the hardest parts of doing this for me is writing out the actual text because I'm not a copywriter at all, but if you are good at writing then that is a definite advantage for this. So to create the actual document I'm using InDesign instead of Illustrator as it handles multiple pages better and also it handles like linked elements better. The file is set up to be a 1080 HD resolution so it will fill a 16 by 9 screen perfectly. That's pretty much industry standard at this point. Uh, your average widescreen TV will be 16 by 9 aspect ratio and probably 1080 or 4K. Now the idea behind the introduction slides are to get the designer using this document to kind of buy into the brand and understand the vision. If they're used to the old Toshiba, they kind of need to be taken away from that mentality and kind of brought into this new lifestyle like human-led brand. Um, so yeah, just a little bit of like text on there mixed with the imagery should hopefully just help them buy into it a bit more. The next section details the logo itself, explaining what you can and can't do, and obviously we have to make examples of each. I also add in an exclusion zone which is basically a gap around the logo which can never be encroached on by any other element. This measurement must be able to scale with the logo itself so it works at any size. In this case I chose the height of the stem on the A as my exclusion zone measurement. And what I mean by this must scale with it is you have to choose some sort of element on the logo to kind of become your reference point because otherwise if you're using the logo that big and you say oh we need a 5mm gap around it. When the logo is that big and you've still got a 5mm gap it's going to be way smaller so things can be buttoned right up to it. So it's best to choose an element on the logo and like use that as like your X and then you can do X times 2 or X times 1.5 or whatever you want really to build that exclusion zone but just make sure it's scalable. And then another page that I added in this document was the minimum size that the logo should appear and although earlier I said 40 millimeters I did a little bit more stress testing on the text sizes and I think 30 millimeters or 35 millimeters would be the smallest size that I'd like to go in print and then I also did a digital equivalent just by seeing the basically getting the pixel measurements at the point where I couldn't read it anymore So once the logo rules were set, it was time to move on to the colours. I'd already pretty much got my colour palette sorted when making part 3 of this video, when making the Option 5 brand board. Um, I'd already chosen the blue, the orange and the black and white. And I think they work really well together, obviously blue and orange are the complementary colours. And like I said in the last video, that idea was basically taken from like movie posters. They often use blue and yellow or blue and orange to kind of just make a real contrast and kind of like a cool colour and a warm colour. Just generally looks good. Um, and then that gradient colour that I use in the background of the brand board as well on the right hand side logo, like the reversed logo had that kind of light in effect, just like where it's like a free form gradient instead of just a flat gradient, so add a little bit more interest. 
But one thing I did have to do was refine the CMYK breakdowns and then include them in the guides so that any designer can pick up the precise colours and not have to rely on like the eyedropper tool or kind of dismantle the artwork and just like make up their own orange. At this point I just don't want to leave anything to guesswork, I want to give them the CMYK values so that if they get something printed they, everything looks consistent, I want to give them the RGB values and also the hex code just so if they're doing any online or on screen work they, everything's consistent. So beneath each of the colours I also added a little explanation of how each colour should be used and then basically that's just to give the designer an idea of how each colour should be used because if they just use them colours however they want everyone's going to do a different thing and it's going to be inconsistent so we want to try and get the point across that blue is for like the main headers the grey is for the text and the orange is for kind of highlights like buttons on the website or like you know like we're using it as the full stop just anything that you want to highlight or just kind of draw the reader's eye to and basically, again, the whole idea here is to just, just lock it down so that not every designer can go putting their own little spin on it and kind of damage the brand continuity. So next up it was the photography guidelines and photography guidelines are always a funny one because you don't want to restrain the creativity too much. I thought that the best thing to do is just show examples of photos that fit and photos that kind of don't have it. Um, there's so many aspects of photography that kind of make the photo either have it or not have it and kind of it takes like a trained eye to kind of see what looks good and what doesn't. To the untrained eye I think these images might look similar but there are a huge range of aspects to the photography that make it either look authentic, natural and like warm and pleasant or kind of cold, corporate, staged and fake um, and it's just a very fine line like you see people like maybe like that are newer to design kind of using the classic handshake images and they're perfectly lit and there's people in the background clapping and smiling and that and it's just it just it's been done it's kind of it just feels like 80s stock photography now um, so yeah it's just kind of getting that balance and then sometimes you'll be looking through stock library and it's too far the other way where it's kind of a very real photo but maybe it's kind of a little bit grainy or they've put some Instagram filter on it so this part always does come a little bit down to the designer's attention to detail and just like whether they've got taste or not um, which can sometimes leave a little bit too much wiggle room which is why a lot of companies have a library of images to choose from instead of letting individual designers make the actual decisions on photography the typography section of the brand guidelines is another aspect which has a lot of room for flex by individual designers as you can't make hard rules on text sizes as different situations call for different treatments and what I mean by that is everything can change like if the title of the advert has three words you're probably going to want to make that bigger than if the title of the advert has like 10 words and as you're not always in control of what the title of an advert should be you just kind of have to have a little bit of flex room so to standardize this I like to use so to stand as I, oh. So to stand as I, oh. It's pronounced standardized. Thank me later. So to standardize this as much as we can, I like to use percentages. For example, there is a rule here where the line spacing of the subtitles is 120% of the font size itself. And by doing it like that, it's scalable again. So if you're working on a billboard, 120% of the font size is still going to be the same as if you're working on a business card, 120% of the font size, uh, the actual visual will look the same. And this scalable approach allows the designer to choose the font size that suits the application whilst ensuring that the line spacing is consistent with every other subtitle in existence. You can take this a step further by making the subtitle a percentage of the main title and then doing the same for the body copy. However, the small differences in ad sizes, title lengths like I mentioned earlier, imagery, etc. means that it's often better to leave it down to the individual designer to make the design work and look balanced. Um, you just have to make sure that you don't let a sloppy designer work on the brand, which might be easier said than done. Shots fired. I repeat, shots fired. Also, as you can see my process here, you might notice that I've been adding in some title pages for the document. Um, whilst this might seem a little unnecessary for some projects, I think it's important to make sure that the designers working on the project are really able to kind of buy into and really believe in the brand. So I like to just give that little bit more information just so they feel like they're getting the inside scoop and they get really on board with the kind of vision behind the brand. So once I got to this point in the project, I realised that I hadn't actually included any guidelines for the gradient background that made up a large part of the identity. 
I added another page that explains the concept of the gradient and also details how you should and shouldn't use it. Um, I just had visions of kind of one step away, like once you've distributed this and someone thinks, oh, I'm gonna make my own background and it's got greys in there, it's got white in there and different colors. I just thought that would be just, it would start to look like an absolute mess. So I had to lay down some rules for that as well. So my favorite part of the brand guidelines and what I call like the real meat inside the guidelines is the brand in the real world pages. This is always the section that I look at most when people supply guidelines to me as it allows me to see how the guides have been used in real world applications including seeing how they might have been slightly flexed for each individual application. So to show this I thought the best way would be to make some mock-ups and I made lots of mock-ups from mockupsdesign.com um, just showing lots of different situations that the logo can be used in. I covered digital use by showing a web visual on an iPhone, a print application by showing a printed flyer mock-up, and then some other general branding mock-ups to show how the logo would be displayed in real life. Even though I'm just creating mock-ups to sell the idea, I like to put thought into the future of each of the items. For example, in the print advert, I didn't just want to create a concept ad that's not actually selling anything. I want to show the lifestyle imagery selling the dream of the experience. Also show the product itself with a small bit of information um, and like a call to action so that the reader knows what's being sold. And then basically the idea behind this is this template could then be used for almost everything that they sell. So it's kind of not just a one advert for one thing, it's kind of a template for future growth. So I don't want to make this video too long and boring by showing you every little edit I made as I was jumping around quite a lot in the document. So I will just show you the final document here. And if you did want to download the document yourself so you can have a good read through without having to pause the video 25 times, then I will put a link in the description so you can download a PDF.
Okay then, so that is it for the Toshiba rebrand mini-series. Um, remember to head straight down to the comments and let me know what you think, what you liked, what you didn't like and what you might have done differently. And remember to press like on this video if you liked it and if you want to see a video like this every single week, remember to press subscribe. Cheers!